Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. Uh, we're going to continue looking at Daniel 11, uh, picking up some loose threads and uh, uh, moving ahead in this study of Daniel chapter 11 in its application for our time. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time that we have once again to study your word together. We're thankful for the things that you are doing in our lives, the trials that we face, and your Holy Spirit speaking to us and strengthening us um, for these conflicts that we experience with self. We know, Lord, that you are seeking to uh, perfect your character in us, something that is impossible for us to do. And so we allow, Lord, your Holy Spirit to work upon our hearts and minds to enlighten us and give us strength and to reveal truths that we can share with others and that will draw all men unto you. Be with us now in this study through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. And... Um, there are a couple of things. So, you know, aside from the study itself, I have conversations with other people. And, um, you know, we did mention a uh, brother, I think he's from Romania, Armageddon 66 is his YouTube page. And uh, there he's, he's going to, um, you know, he's been watching the videos and he responded. He gave me some links in the comments in yesterday's study to um, Chawatu and Kimberly's study. And why can I not see it here now? Comment. Hmm. I had links there and I can't see them now. So says I have a comment, but click on the comments. Says I don't have a comment. So he must have removed the comment or something. I don't know. Sometimes I just don't see the comments. Let me do it this way. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning. Oops. There we go. Okay. That was the yesterday's study. It says I have one comment, but I don't see the comment. So sometimes YouTube blocks things with links in the comment. Why? That makes no sense. Um, well, I do have the videos because I did open up the links. So they're in my history. Um, So the links were to uh, part 4A and part 5A of Chawatu's study on Daniel chapter 11. Now, he's not, not actually addressing the verses here that we were addressing. So he's going to uh, be moving on to the, the verses that we are going to be addressing. Um, now it says this study, these were posted six years ago. So that probably means 2017. These were posted. And there just isn't any more um, of these presentations anywhere. So, um, but anyway, that's what he had connected me a link to. So I don't understand this thing of blocking things with links. That makes no sense unless the links are. Yeah, YouTube is getting really crazy. Um, even on Facebook too, because on Facebook, when I post things, it always tells me that, you know, that this has to follow community guidelines, you know, so I post my videos on these different pages. And um, I did have a review of the community guidelines, which um, uh, removed, I believe it removed the strike or the warning that I had on my channel by doing this review. So I don't have a warning anymore which is nice. Um, but I'm just seeing here. Uh, and, yeah, 
Yeah, so I think I got that warning removed, which was nice. But anyway, but the, you know, the thought police are out there um, trying to control what we watch and what information we get, which is obviously not good. So <clears throat> anyhow, so we can't, I mean, I don't know what Chawatu's view is particularly on this verse, right? When we were talking about uh, verse five and six. So, so it didn't really help. I mean, it's nice that he gave me links to some of these videos, but unless somebody can find the videos, the pertinent videos, so it'd be one, two, and three, um, and probably three more likely. Um, I can't really say what Chowatu's views are on this. So Stephen, if he watches this video, he might know more. He might have some information, some papers. Um, but I don't think uh, there's a great difference in the idea because what we are doing is we're applying this more specifically to our time. So we know that um, that this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south is typical of what happens in Daniel 11, verse 40. And so we can connect the time of the end. That's what we've been able to do. We've been able to connect the time of the end in 1798 with the time of the end in 1989. Right? Just like we do in Daniel 11, verse 40. Now, how specifically do we do it here? If somebody could just review this for us. What is it that we see about Alexander's kingdom that connects us to 1798. What was the main thing we picked up, picked up on initially? In verse three, the mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. How did we connect this with 1798 and thus with 1989? As I was recalling, we had quite a bit here that said that this could not be one of the Persian kings, or that it had it had to have have been um, the as they looked at it historically, it had to have been a Grecian king. Right. So first, we're going to have Alexander. Right. He's going right. to be. The one that does according to his will. And we we pick up on this phrase according to his will to connect us to a time of the end. Right? Now we know it's first going to be applied to Medo Persia. And now Medo Persia is marked at the time of the end when Babylon falls, right? Right. So it's, it's still there. It's not the kingdom. Babylon is not the kingdom that does according to its will. It's going to be made of Persia, but that phrase there is there. And it's also going to be uh, made of Persia that's going to issue the decrees according to its will, according to its law, right? A will is a covenant, is a law, right? And, and so then we could connect this phrase to the papacy in 1798, prior to 1798, this period of the 1260. That we can connect this here then to Alexander's kingdom. But we can also connect it then to the Soviet Union prior to 1989. So, so we have a way of connecting these things that, that Chawatu never considered, um, that I don't think that we had considered before. That is, in examining Daniel chapter 11, we can mark it more clearly in our lines than we could in the past. And then we can see that the standing up of this kingdom, we, we showed through the numbers here in, in the Hebrew definitions, that this fits perfectly with our history. It gives us dates and spans of time that could not have occurred by chance. So we can show then that Daniel 11 verse 6 is 9-11 and that that history from 9-11 that connects 9-11 not, not connects and November 9th, 19, 
or, or not, 2019, that it connects those together. So whatever Chalatu says can only be a initial understanding of this history because we have a much more clear understanding because we've passed through a history and we've established from the study of the Book of Judges a much clearer understanding of how these lines fit into our history. So none of this is, is disparaging you know, views and ideas that this movement held in the past as somehow error. It's just, it's a development of truth, an unfolding of truth to this movement. So we're gonna get some details wrong as we're looking at prophecies before they are fulfilled. But after we go through those events, we have a clear understanding of them. So hopefully that's helpful for people to understand what we have here in this, in these verses. So that when we get to verse 10, we're now going to begin repeating um, that history of our movement in some way, some detail. Now, what we, I guess what I'm proposing, but what the movement is understood. We understand that Daniel chapter 11, verse 11, is the Battle of Raphia. And this was on January 17th, or January 14th, 2017, that Jeff is going to present not just Raphia, but also Pinean in connection with uh, these two dates which we call uh, midnight in the midnight cry. Between that, there's going to be a pandemic. He doesn't have dates for those events, but they later are attached to November 9th, 2019 and July 18, 2020. And between those two dates, we have the pandemic, right? Agreed. Yeah, so so we know that 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 in some way, whether it's just an application that the connecting with that history, the history of Trump and the history of Biden is this raffia and pineum. Right. So, so we know that now we couldn't have known that before. Now we had uh, Trump as the last president of the United States and we understood it in a certain way. That is, we thought, well, the United States is going to fall. The Sunday law is going to come. We're not going to have any more president of the United States. You know, it's going to move into the UN, right? Now, of course, that did happen, but not in the way that we expected. This happened with Trump, who is Xerxes, who was deceived. Um, and, and in that history of two histories in the Book of Esther, we have the history of Xerxes, in his stirring up all against the realm of Grisha and losing to Greece. And then we have Xerxes in a sort of repeat of history, but a different illustration dealing with um, Purim, Purim, however you want to say it, right? With the decree. And both of those histories il are illustrated by Trump, but they're illustrating different aspects of the history of Trump, right? The first is just his defeat, his stirring up all against the realm of Grecia. We know he's going to be defeated by Greece. And after he's defeated by Greece, you know, because that in chapter one, it's going to be three years later that he actually takes this battle against Greece. So he does lots of preparation. And then after losing that battle, he comes back to Persia. And then he's going to take Esther as his wife to replace Vashti. And in that story, we can see, once again, an illustration of events in our movement in connection with the, a type of the Sunday law, which is the pandemic, and that we connected those histories with our history. So each time we look at these different stories, we can see how they're illustrating our history. We did it with the book of Judges. We're doing it now with Daniel chapter 11. So if we go back to verse 10, but his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. 
Then he shall return and be stirred up even to his fortress. Now, who is this? But his son shall be stirred up. Who is his in this verse? Because the king of the south shall come to into his kingdom, shall return into his own land. Right? So now, now it says, but his son shall be stirred up. Remember, in Hebrew, it's not as clear cut as in English who the his refers to. But somebody it returns and returns even to his fortress. So whose fortress is this? Who is the his sons? We know we have this overflow and pass through. So overflow refers to the Sunday law. So is this verse 10 attached to verse 9? Or is this starting in the new history? So I know I'm having you guys jump into this and try to figure this out. Now, historically, I mean, we look at this, you know, in Uriah Smith's Daniel and Revelation. The first part of this verse speaks of sons in the plural, the last part of one in the singular. Right. Um, so I'm not sure. Um exactly what he what he's getting at here he says the sons of seleucus callinicus were seleucus seranus and, and antiochus magnus these both entered with zeal upon the work of vindicating and avenging the cause of their father in their country the elder of these seleucus first took the throne he assembled a great multitude to recover his father's dominions but was poisoned by his generals after a short and glorious reign his more capable brother antiochus magnus was thereupon proclaimed king. He took charge of the army, recovered Seleucia and Syria, and made himself master of some places by treaty and others by force of arms. Antiochus overcame Nicholas, the Egyptian general, in battle and had thought of invading um, Egypt itself. However, a truce followed wherein both sides treated for peace, yet prepared for war. Here's the one who should certainly overflow and pass through. Now, whether Uriah Smith is correct or not here, that's, you know, that's to be determined. I mean, there might be different views on how to interpret this. But one of the things is we have is this overflow. And this is a symbol for the Sunday law. So, yeah, I'm, you know, as I have followed what you said about the Hebrew versus the English. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at Daniel 11, 9, and I'm taking it strictly by, yeah. strictly by the English, I'm looking at this, that the king of the south shall come into his kingdom, since that's an added word. Yeah. Is it meaning it, that the king of the south has now come into his own kingdom and not the kingdom of the king of the north? Yeah, my understanding, he comes into his own kingdom. He shall return into his own land, right? All right. That, that's so, the way that I put that. But, um, you know, definitely people have different views. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm just looking at Al Albert Barnes over here on the side, right? right? And he says something similar here. Uh, Seleucus, um, uh, pardon me, yeah, Seleucus Callinicus. Um, so let me see here. He says, okay, it's a bunch of stuff. Here it means, according to Jesenius lexicon, that they would be excited or angry. The reference here, according to Ligurki, Morgil, and others, is that the son of the king of the north, Seleucus Callinicus, he was killed, according to Justin by a fall from a horse. The war with Egypt was continued by his two sons, Seleucus, Seranus, and Antiochus the Great, until the death of the former, when it was persecuted by Antiochus alone. Seleucus, Seranus succeeded his father uh, again. So he shall, so this is about assembling uh, a military army from the king of the north. So they're going to say, um, the sun shall be stirred up. These are the sons of the king of the north 
shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. So here we can just say that the his would refer to the king of the north, not to the king of the south. So in English, we would just think, but his son shall be stirred up. We would just go to the preceding uh, person and we'd say, well, that's the king of the south, right? It's not talking about the king of the north. But in this context, we could see how other people are interpreting this as the king of the north is going to come. Now, if we look at the king of the south, then this would be verse 10 would be Paneum, right? This would be the response to the king of the south coming against the king of the north and then the king of the north responding. And I think that's consistent with what we see. Um, now, so if we were to take his son shall be stirred up and this is the king of the south, then that doesn't make sense, right? We, we would have to apply this to verse 11, right? But also we have this word fortress. So when we look at the fortress, what is that? Is that the strength? Oh, the, the which? Strength. Okay, it's strength, but it we've applied it to the Constitution. Okay. Right? That's how we've been applying it. Right? He shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north. So the fortress is something that the king of the north has. Right? Which is this Constitution. So... Because we have the language of the Sunday law, we can see here that this response of the king of the north, that his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, right? So we have here, what he says is we have this plural, the sons, and then we have the singular, the one shall certainly come. Um, so, so if we're going to apply this to our time, we would apply this to the power that is going to bring in the Sunday law. But it is the king of the north, right? That is the Republicans. That is, It's the United States. But in the United States, we have this division of globalists and Republicans, Democrats and Republicans. And that it's generally, we would we just have to say in the sort of general sense, it's the Republicans who bring in the Sunday law. But obviously, the whole United States is caught up in this. It can't be, and it happens after a civil war. So there's a war that's that's won, so to speak, by those that have the fortress. Um, so he shall return. So we have that word shuv. And then he shall be stirred up, gara. That's probably that's properly means to great. That is in anger, uh, great probably in the sense of uh, grinding your teeth, right? So he's going to return, you know, with grinding of the teeth, um, even to his fortress, Maaz, right? So this word, fortified place, of wrong rock, strength, of fortification, of defense, um, stronghold, right? And so we're going to see this fortress, strongholds, all these things mentioned again and again in Daniel 11. And, and these are associated with the king of the north. Now, yeah, the translators had, had some alternates that they applied in this verse. Okay. So, well, I'm looking at Daniel 11.10. The passage that reads, but his sons shall be stirred up, comma. Mm -hmm. The alternate that the, tra the translators had used was, but his sons shall war. Yeah. And shall assemble a multitude of great forces. One and one with one being again a, a supplied word. Yeah. Shall certainly come. And overflow and pass through. Now, here, the one that shall come 
was being pointed to referenced either from Isaiah 8.8 8 or Daniel 9.26. Yeah, and also, of course, Daniel 11.22, Daniel 11.40. Yeah, so we know that that overflowing, especially in Isaiah uh, 8 and in Daniel 9. In Daniel 9, it's going to be regarding uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, which is the type of the end of the destruction of the end of the world. And in, Dan, in Isaiah chapter 8, that's going to be Assyria coming even up to the neck. But we have applied that, and that's a battle between the north and the south, right? You know, that, that's being addressed there. There's that uh, syro ephraimitic war. And uh, so we've already applied that to this idea of the overflow. So this is about the Sunday law. Okay, so... When, when I'm reading this, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, then he shall return and be stirred up. The portion, then he shall return, in the alternate would read, then shall be stirred up again. Yeah, which I don't understand that, how they get up, get again. You know, just probably they're adding that because, you know, he stirred up and he stirred up, you know, so they're probably just, it's repeating. But there isn't any implication of again. In there. So we know that this, from this verse, yeah, is going to represent a... a battle, a war. And haven't we been seeing the situation over the last three plus years of a battle really against the Constitution occurring within the United States? Mm -hmm. So I look at this and I'm having to to consider that the the king of the south as they are being represented right now are doing the the best they can to war against the fortress or the strength of what has been the United States which has been the constitution and but but the ironic thing is that the king of the north, um, it's it's also undermining the constitution just in another way. Right. Well, the king of the south is definitely opening the door to yeah. many that would not have even thought of making major changes with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So they are, they are coming up against what has been the strength of this country. So, you know, back in the 1990s, you know, I'm a relatively new Adventist, I've been Adventist for 10 years or more. And looking at the coming Sunday law, I'm thinking, how is it going to be that the world and the United States are going to support a Sunday law? The, the society is becoming more and more secular. And the only thing I could conceive is that, you know, things are going to get so bad that there just be, um, you know, grabbing of the stereo wheel from the left ditch going into the right ditch. Um, and, and that's, of course, what we see. We see things getting so crazy that that people will be willing to, to go to the other extreme, right? We live in a world of extremes. And, and the left has become so extreme 
that even the left can't stand it. Right? Right. They, they, they paint themselves into such uh, an intellectual corner that it, it contradicts, you know, you had all these feminists talking about women's rights, and now they can't talk about women's rights anymore. Because what is a woman? Right. We don't even know. And, and of course, some feminists are pretty upset about it. And when they try to speak out against it, they get, um, you know, uh, boycotted or censored or whatever they call it, canceled. Right. Um, so so everybody's living in fear. And of course, we've had some crazy things happen in the last few years. You know, BLM and, and all this kind of stuff. And of course, these things are starting to unravel. We're starting to see the insanity of these things. But we're going to go from one insanity to another. And it's and it's not going to come easy, right? That is, a civil war creates extremes. And, and so to see the United States uh, devolve into civil war and then uh, come out of that with... The other extreme, that to me is the only scenario that I can see that's going to cause a Sunday law. I can't see just a gradual movement of like the religious right just becoming gradually more powerful and then, um, you know, taking over the United States. It has to be everybody's behind it. There has to be, you know, a clear cut winner. It has to be the people, whether they intellectually agree or not, emotionally they're going to be on the side of the Sunday law, whatever their reasons are behind it. And so I don't, I don't know exactly all the details, but to me, this is what is being described here. When we get this, if we look at the King of the South as being this, this group that's going to attack, you know, the constitution, enter into the fortress of the King of the North, Right, that it's going to carry captive into Egypt their gods with their princes, with their precious vessels of silver and gold, and shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south comes into his own land, right? But now the king of the north is going to be stirred up. This is the war, assembling a great multitude and overflows. And this overflow is the Sunday law. So the response. And it's going to be stirred up even to his fortress. Well, it's going to believe that they're what they're doing is preserving the Constitution when, in fact, they're going to be destroying the, the principles of the Constitution in bringing in a Sunday law. But to them, that will seem the strengthening of, of, of the Constitution by whatever means they're going to use to, to do that, to bring about this correction but really is an overcorrection so i think we have to put verse 10 as part of that line and um so when we had drawn out the line yesterday and, and if you have any other thoughts on this anyone just uh share them um so we had drawn out this line yesterday put the way marks you might want to bring it up. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Okay. And um, so you can see we put uh, Biden's inauguration as the empowerment of the second angel's message. The second angel's message here has to do with uh, the control or power of the South, right? That is the globalists dealing with you know, what happens in the pandemic in November of 2019. And then um, that battle, that formalization that happens um, from July 18th to January 6, 2021. Um, you know, so in there that we have this civil war going on over this, what's happening with the pandemic. But Biden is going to end up as the president in January 20th, 21, right? In spite of the efforts of Republicans to, to 
to put to keep Trump in office. And then um, so then we have this date, December 25th, 2023. And we're just saying, well, that date, you know, we're, we're putting as a symbol of the Sunday law. That's the third angel's message arrived. That's why I put it December 25th. Now, we do have the 391 and a half days to January 20th, 2025. So, so that symbol being attached to this, we would have to place as the fourth angel's message arriving. Right. In this type of line. OK, so we place this here. And that is, of course, when the next president, the Civil War president, where we have a hot civil war, is going to show up. But this line here leads us to December 25th, 2023. It's, you know, not very far away. Um, but it's just a symbol. We're not predicting some event. So we know that in this, uh, the intervening period from December 25th, 2023 to January 20th, 2025, this is that period that we're seeing the election. I mean, it's already started, but I, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly how the American political process is so bizarre because you have all of these primaries going on to first get your Republican and Democrat nominees. And are these fixed dates that they have that they, because have they had any primaries already for the Republican nomination? No. When do those occur in February? The primaries since the since the election is going to be in 2024 yeah the primaries will begin i'll, I'll look it up as we're as we're talking okay. um, i mean they're doing lots of polling regarding you know even what's going to happen in the primaries and, and of course we have the politicians going to these different cities where primaries are going to be held and right. doing rap Right. So, you know, they got so the, some, yeah. as as we would go through this, you're going to have primaries where a single state votes. Then you're going to have primaries where multiple states vote. Your initial is going to begin with a, what's called a closed caucus, which is the Iowa caucus yeah, where, Iowa. They, where all of all of the state assembles in different meetings to decide who they they want to say they want to vote for. So the yeah. Iowa caucus is always this first one, right? Iowa caucus has been the first, but then the first primary is going to be New Hampshire. Okay, so the New Hampshire primaries. Now what are the dates for these? Uh, the Iowa caucuses will be on Monday, the 15th of January. Okay. And the New Hampshire primary will be Tuesday, the 23rd of January. Okay. Now, from there, um, you have a, a primary for Democrats alone. February 3rd, which will be South Carolina. On February 6th, you have a primary for both Democrats and Republicans. On the 24th of February, you have the South Carolina Republican primary. And on the 27th, you then wind up with what's called the Michigan primary. And then there's something called Super Tuesday or something? Correct. Super Tuesday is going to be one where you have multiple states all holding a primary. And okay. on the Super Tuesday, what it what it generally does is it either defines the candidate that that has been the front runner or it brings in someone that's not been a true front runner and all of a sudden has enough votes to go to a um, a convention and cause issues. Okay. 
Now, now with um, this election, because there's lots we don't know about what's going to happen, but I mean, it seems unlikely to me that uh, Biden's going to run. Now, now since he's an incumbent president, they still have their primaries. Like they still have people decide to run against them. But sometimes there's nobody really running against, or at least nobody's taking seriously anybody who's running against the incumbent, right? Okay, just like okay in the in the 1940 election, you had some Democrats that were running against Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Okay, they didn't get very far because Roosevelt was a very popular president. Right, so it's not going to really be a big issue. It's just the incumbent president. He's just going to basically he'll just win all the primaries, and nobody really. It's not a big fight or anything. Okay, okay, now, 28 years later, in 1968, mm-hmm. you had an incumbent president, a sitting president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who had won one of the greatest landslides in history against Barry Goldwater in 1964. Yeah. Yet, after the primary season, as things were progressing, Johnson made the decision when he when he was seeing what was going on in the country that he did not wish to seek nomination for president in 1968. So it came down to a convention where the man that won the majority of the delegates for the Democratic convention was murdered right after Super Tuesday, and that was Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. So you go into that convention, the front runner is gone. The guy that now is is coming in was somewhat popular, but he had some ideas that that did not fly with the rest of the country, and it led to Richard Nixon being elected. Yeah. So this does go back to the very kind of the beginning of the country because there would be people that would seek to run for office. Washington really didn't want to run for office, but he accepted it. And for eight years, he was the initial president under the Constitution. The man that became his vice president, Adams, became the second president. But as as wise as a man as he was, he was not hugely popular. Well, so anyway, the point that we see here is that when it comes to Biden, he's not popular. Right. Now, he could try to run, but there would be other people running against him. There there are already other people that are seeking the nomination. Biden is popular with very small, select groups. Right. So, I mean, he's not going to win the nomination, even if he he runs. So he may drop out of the nomination and and may happen before the primaries even. Right. And we well just don't know what his health condition is. I mean, he, he's living on borrowed time. He is he is probably the most mentally weak president that we have had since James Buchanan. Oh, yeah. He is probably the most ill president that we have had since Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah, so so yeah, so it's unlikely. So there would be some other candidate. And you know, you never know. December 25th might mark some event. But symbolically December 25th is the Sunday law, right? Cuz we have that in 508, we have that marked numerous places. And so so that and, and the fact that it shows up in our line in that way with the four winds of heaven going from 
uh, you know, this this Soviet Afghan war to December 25th, 23rd, plus the word year, Shana, going from 9-11 to that date. You know, so we have that date marked. And so we can mark it as the third angel arriving. Right? We can mark it as a symbol of the Sunday month. But one thing we know about this line is this line is not the big line, right? This is a zoom into, this is a repeat of history. This line is addressing basically how the king of the south conquers the king of the north in our history. So this isn't going to be addressing the king of the north defeating the king of the south which we have in verse 10, right? Though we could maybe attach that to January 20th, 2025, but we don't know if that's the next way mark because we put it there as the fourth angel arrives. You understand what I'm saying, right? We have this verse 10, which shows the Sunday law. And we're saying, well, December 25th, 2023 is a symbol of the Sunday law. And so we could put verse 10 there, but it's obviously not the Sunday law, right? Okay. We're not expecting a Sunday law on December 25th, 2023. We're just saying this line of the King of the South comes to this point, comes to this symbol of the Sunday law. Now, um, I'm having a discussion with a, a guy who used to be an Adventist. He was an Adventist from uh, um, 1964 to 1982, and since then he's no longer been an Adventist. So he must be pretty old. Um, I don't know if he counts 64, right, the year he was born or the year he was baptized. Oh, but he's definitely older than me, I would think, unless it was the year he was born, then he'd be a year younger. But in 82, he ceased to be an Adventist. A guy named Doug Mace, um, friends with him on Facebook, and I was having this discussion with Charlie Smith. Charlie Smith shared our discussion with a number of different people, David Rice and Doug Mason and Doug Mason and I are having a conversation over Bible prophecy. And um, he's writing a book in which he addresses uh, the idea of Adventist Bible prophecy. And um, so this, in this here, he's got, I'm just trying to find this book. But he makes this argument about um So it's the first chapter of his book. And and he has this view sort of, well, all of this where people take Bible prophecy and apply it to their own time is wrong, right? He uses the word dangerous. But what we see throughout history is, is God's people. There is a present truth application to God's word in every generation, right? There isn't a generation that goes by that they can't look at the prophecies of God's word and say, well, that's not for us. There's something that God is showing that generation. We're, we're all, in a sense, in this stream of prophecy. So, you know, he makes arguments about a type kiss epiphanies and different things like that. He thinks, you know, that they made a wrong mistake in applying things their time. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand all of his arguments. I haven't read everything. Um, but when he gets to, he goes all through history of how different people have interpreted Daniel chapter 9. And, and I would say just because people don't, just because we don't fully understand a prophecy and we apply it incorrectly to our time, does it mean that we're doing something wrong? To me, that's part of watching and waiting. And, and there is an application. As we can see, we can see here we have a line. It's an application of prophecy to our time. Now, the problem would come when we start to say something like, well, December 25th, 2023 is a symbol of the Sunday law. And I think the Sunday law is going to happen on that day, right? And the one thing we can know is that these lines can show us that these things are approaching but it cannot give us the time of these events. Right? 
Correct. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we're not doing anything wrong in, in recognizing where we are in these lines, but we would be doing something wrong, so to speak, if I started to make predictions about exactly what's going to happen. Now, we do have, in a sense, a prediction, though. We're saying that the next president, January 20th, 2025, is going to be, there's going to be a civil war in the United States. Now, that is sort of predicting, right? But it's not really in the sense we're, we're in the middle of a civil war. We're just saying it's going to become a hot civil war. Well, maybe it, maybe it doesn't. Maybe things unfold differently than we expect. But I don't think there's anything wrong with applying these lines the way that that we have and to recognize that we have dates in the future that are testified by God's word, testified, witnessed to by God's word. And that as these events have passed, we've seen the significance of them, even though those significances are different than what we thought. But I think we have a much better handle on understanding what these things mean now, that we're not going to, you know, make those types of predictions that were made in the past regarding dates. But even if these seven kings only apply in a sort of the limited sense within our line, within our history, and that there's some other way to understand them that we don't know, we yeah. can't see if they're not, not there, we still have to accept them as this is what God is showing us. And some people have a hard time with that. But to me, this is the only way that we can operate with Bible prophecy is that we have to see that God is speaking to us now. Right. And, and he's doing this to show us our need of him to give witness to his power, his control in the events that we see in history and the events that occur in our own lives. Right. So these are not. It's not about predicting the future and getting it right as much as understanding what God is saying to us now as far as our individual responsibility in sharing the gospel, in recognizing our sins, in being truly converted. All of those things are what prophecy is about. It's not really about predicting the future so that you're in the know about events. I don't know. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, yes, because, I mean, it's written that uh, present truth is for our time. And, of course, God is concerned with everything in our lives, even the tiniest aspects of our lives, as we read on Sabbath, last Sabbath. And we're not time setting. Like, we're not saying, okay, this is going to occur when. That would that would make us fortune tellers, which we're certainly not. And God reveals things step by step. And also scientists, a true scientist is going to experiment. He's going to check this and check that. Now, I conclude that this, but then if, 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 if his experiment, if the conclusions of his experiment can, can be replicated and replicated and replicated, then that proves that what he hypothesized was the truth. It's the same thing with Bible prophecy. You know, we, we, we can see the parallels between the past and present. So if this mm -hmm. comes to this end, then why not? Why wouldn't it continue? in the future type of thing. No. Yeah. God is leading us us on step by step on the path to the go to the heavenly city, right? And and we are exercising faith in what God has revealed to us. And some people think, well, you know, if the Millerites were wrong, then then they obviously weren't being led by God. And then if God had actually hid to, from them of a mistake, then God is some kind of a deceiver. But God is works with us in this way, step by step, for us learning to trust in his leading. Just like a parent with a child. A child may not understand, you know, everything the parent says. But the parent presents things in a way that the child can at least respond and grow and 
and learn to trust the parent. And, and this is what God has done with us. He's led this movement. And, you know, there are people who in, in every movement after they're disappointed, like in Millerite history, they're going to go off into speculations, right? They're not going to learn the lesson that God wants them to learn. The lessons are really about um, God's character in comparison to our character. So, I mean, I'm going, we, we're going into this, you know, discussion about this because here we have dates in the future and we're marking things on a line and we can see that, that we're in this history. And I think we're analyzing this history correctly. I think there's other people trying to look at this history and they're not analyzing it correctly. And the question is why? Why is it that they can't do what we're doing? Why is it they won't draw these things properly on the line? Why is it that they won't look at all the information? And, and these lines are witnessing against them. Right? So, so this becomes a, a very difficult problem. Uh, are we going to understand these lines correctly? Are we going to apply them not just to history, but to our own lives correctly? Can we see our place here, what God is trying to show us about ourselves? Not just, you know, so that we can know the future and have some kind of uh, prediction about future events. So, so anyway, getting back then to these lines, we can see that verse 10, and I didn't put the verses on the line, but verse 10 would apply to December 25th, 2023, because of the symbol of the Sunday law. But we would have a different line once we get to verse 11. Because verse 11 is the battle of Raphia. Now, I say, and this is just me saying it, that this is a future event. This is not the battle of Raphia that we mark as January 6th, 2021. Right? Now, we mark that as Raphia because in a line it is. But I would say when we get to the verse about the Battle of Raphia, that's still a Battle of Raphia that's future. Now, how do we feel about that statement? What do we think about it? Because that's going to be the way mark that's marked on the bigger line as midnight. And I would say that we haven't come to that way mark yet. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you, so I don't know where you came in. I just saw you now. But how long have you been here? Uh, just a few minutes. I was thinking okay. uh, the, the hours have gone forward here, so I forgot that it was an hour earlier. <laughs> that you yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you, you have the time change already. We get ours next week. So we'll be back to normal next week. Um, yeah, so, you know, we discussed a little bit um, regarding... Uh, Chowatu and Kimberly's studies, because uh, the guy sent me links to four and five, um, but he didn't have links to one, two, and three. And um, I don't know if you have access to those at all, but we decided that Chowatu's and Kimberly's studies are just a, a partial understanding of these verses, that the way that we look at it, because we've passed through history, we can make a more correct application, so to speak, of, of these verses and seeing that they connect with uh, the changes that have happened in our line in connection with uh, the Democrats or the globalists taking over the United States. And then we look at verse 10, the sun shall be stirred up. This is talking about the Sunday law and on our lines that's going to bring us to December 25th, 2023 as a symbol. We're not saying that the Sunday law happens there. But then when we get to verse 11, it's going to bring us back again to the beginning of this line. Now, 
I think that verse 11 is raphia. That is, this is, if we're going to draw all of Daniel 11 on a line in, in some way, we could say that raphia is the midnight cry. That is something that's future, that will be seen. And we haven't experienced that raphia on January 6, 2021. We've just experienced within our line, within this line of what we've been dealing with in this movement, that's going to be um, symbolized by these other battles of the king of the south over con conquering the king of the north. But here, this would be the future. So if anybody has thoughts about that, I mean, we know we could apply this still to our line. We could take Daniel 11, 11, and we can put it at January 6th, 2021, right? We can, we can put it in our history. But I, I just think that, that that's still not this raffia, right? Obviously, any of these lines can line up and they can typify events. But any thoughts on that? Nobody has thoughts on about how we apply Daniel 11, 11. Well, at this, at, at this point, of course, there's some obvious points and there's some not so obvious points. Okay. One of the obvious points, as we have been addressing in other studies, is that Daniel 11, 11 would have some kind of interrelation with the second angel's message. Okay. Because it looks to be a doubling. Okay, yeah. So it so it and and we understand that. So it's going to be the arrival of the second angel's message. Okay. So as the verse itself reads, and the king of the south shall be moved with Kohler. Now Kohler being defined as what? Anger? Uh. Anger, yeah. Okay. And shall come forth to fight with him. Now, the king of the south is not going to fight with himself. So this, from the English, would be that he's coming forth to fight with the king of the north, right? Um, yes. So he's going to fight with the king of the north. It says fight with him, even with the king of the north, right? So we know that's the Battle of Raphia. We can put this in history. But, but why, why from the Hebrew is it that he shall come to fight with him, even the king of the north, with even being the only supplied word? What is it that is leading this to another doubling? Uh, I, I don't understand your question. Okay. Why, just because it says him, the king of the north? Yes. <clears throat> That's just Hebrew. Okay. Uh, so you'll see that the word him actually doesn't have any Hebrew number attached with it. Okay. So it's just telling you the king of the north is masculine. Okay. And he shall set forth a great multitude. Is the he in this referring to the king of the north or the king of the south? Um, and he's going to set forth a great multitude. Yeah, and it says he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. So the multitude is um, is the king of the north's multitude, but that multitude is going to be given into the hand of the king of the south. And when he has taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up. Because we know how this is fulfilled historically. This is Raphia. So this is the king of the south. This is Egypt, right, conquering uh, the Seleucid Empire, right, at least winning a battle in and that. That, yeah. that battle of Raphia took place when? Uh, is it June 22nd, 2017, BC? 
It's June 22nd, 217 BC. That, that, yeah, okay. That, that's what I meant to say, if I said I, something else. <laughs> yeah, 217 BC. I think I said 2017. Yes, yeah. you did. 217 BC, right? So we have a symbol of midnight, right? July 7th. And we also have this symbol that is a symbol of FFA, uh, 622, June 22nd. So both of those symbols are placed there with the Battle of Raphia. Now, it's also interesting that 217 is if you take the 434 years and you divide them in half, you're going to get uh, 217 years, right? So from 408 BC to 27 AD is 434 years, and half of that is 217. So, so that that ties in with that structure of the 70 weeks as well. But that's kind of a whole other study. But we also did have the center date, which is um, 191 BC, already referenced, right? So we have that symbol of the 191. Right. <clears throat> and that was um, dealing with um, taking verse... Uh, was verse six and adding up all the Hebrew numbers, right? And we got a number uh, 23,111. And that is 11 times 11 times 191. So can we see here that, that in this verse 1111, we have a division of, with that symbol of 217 BC, we have a division of the 300 and, um, 434 years, which is 191 BC. So can we see how verse 6 is tied to verse 11 of Daniel in that way? Was that too complicated? Do I need to show people what, what I'm talking about? We can see, therefore, that that it's that it can can be be a be, be a symbol of raphia on a line. Okay, yeah. So one ninety one, which is of course the study that uh, Dwight had done, um, and we also had it in the one hundred ninety one years as well. But Dwight had done this study uh, at the camp meeting at Telford Muse, and in that study he had marked. The center date, um, I'm trying to find this, I'm trying to find a diagram with this. Um, yeah, no, I, I should draw a diagram with this, I guess, but. No, for some reason, I don't have this drawn out. Okay, not in any of these charts here. But it's just simply, you just take the 70 weeks, you've got the 62 weeks, you divide them in half, they're 31 weeks. 31 times 7 is 217, right? And we can see that that relates to the week of Christ, the midst of the week, that week in 31 AD. But we also have this... 217 years, and if we go from 27 AD and you count 217 years back, it'll bring you to 191 BC. And the event in 191 BC, what is that, Dwight? It has to do with Rome. Well, 191 <clears throat> is the midpoint after the first 50 years of the 490. Yeah, but it but the event in 191 BC, the midpoint is it's Thermopylae. Thermopylae, right? It's April 24, 191 BC. 
Yeah. That's where it's where Rome defeats Greece. Right. So that becomes an important date. Yes, and it does. From all of this, right? What, what we're studying here. So, but now we can take this 217, the 191, and we can say, you know, when we look at verse six, so in verse six, when I added up all of the Hebrew numbers, I think it was verse six. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was verse six. I don't think it was verse five. It was in verse three. Anyway, um, one of the verses there, I added up all of the Hebrew numbers and I came to 21,111 or 23,111. And 23,111 is 11 times 11 times 191. So it gives us Daniel 1111, right? And Daniel 1111 gives us 2117, right? Because it's going to give us the Battle of Rapia. And 2117 is times two is 434. And the center of that chiasm is 191. So this is like a circle bringing us back. Okay. So hopefully that's understood, um, understandable. So I'm, I'm going to draw a diagram of that. I won't do it right now. So now we have the Battle of Raphia. So this becomes this important verse. Now it's important in a number of ways. So we've we've tied eleven eleven to eleven generations to the flood, eleven generations from the flood to the going down into Egypt by Jacob. So the twenty two generations. Um, we have the eleven and the eleven years in the story of Joseph, which is twenty two years from his dreams, eleven year to. Um, the, the dreams of the butler and the baker, and then another 11 years to his dreams being fulfilled. Um, we had significance in, in the book of Judges in 11.11. Uh, there's a bunch of 11.11s, right? So it's it's a significant uh, symbol. And here in Daniel 11.11, we have the Battle of Raphia. It is what we would call midnight. Now, we applied midnight to 9.11. Or, or 11 9, pardon me, 11 9, 2019. And we applied Paneum to January 18, 2020. Well, that's obviously in a line. That's not the Raffia on the big line. And then we applied Raffia to January 6, 2021. And then there's going to be a response that is going to be within the United States um, that we're going to call Paneum. But I would still argue that both of those precede what we would call raffia on the line where raffia is the midnight cry on Jeff's line, or midnight, pardon me, on Jeff's line, and and Paneum is the midnight cry. <clears throat> yeah, so when Rome defeated Greece, it replaced common law rights with Roman law. Okay, so it's just a note that Angela made about 191. So, but anyway, the point is, I believe that when we're looking at these lines that we are drawing, we're not yet on that line that Jeff had, where you have 9-11, you know, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. We're not to midnight yet. And, and many people think that we are, right? Because we've marked midnight in our lines in various places but we know that those are our fractals or wheels within wheels of something on a bigger line and that god is giving us this light now because we need to be prepared to give a message that is going to affect adventism and the whole world in the end and it's obviously not our views on you know, uh, the election right now that are those messages because it will be something that's later. Our experience right now is to develop in us a Christ-like character because we are not like Christ in our character, right? We, we have all kinds of problems that, you know, God wants us to face. God loves us. 
He wants us to change. He wants to use us. This is how he does it. But any, any more comments about Daniel 11, 11 being a way mark that's still future? That isn't January 6, 2021 and isn't obviously November 9th, 2019. Are people happy with that, what I've said? I don't see that I can disagree with what you said. Okay, so, so we have events that are still future, but yet we can apply these symbols to our line, right? That is, we can parallel Daniel 11.11 with... 11.6, right? And I'm pretty sure that was the line I added up. Might not have been, it might have been five, but it doesn't make sense. Let me see. Yeah, it might have been verse five. Um, I don't know. I thought it was verse, maybe it was verse four. But... I am so one, two. Anyway, I'm going to have to figure out which verse it was I was counting, adding up. But it's 23,111, uh, one of these verses. Actually, it might have been verse 3. Um, I'm just doing some math here. Any any more comments? It was a phrase or something. I'm gonna have to go back and look at what that was that I did. Yeah, originally, the uh, application was that Rafia would have been Russia in some way coming back against the United States. Yeah, we know that that's wrong. I mean, that was applied to November 9th and and then Paneum to July 18, 2020. And, and in our understanding, as we've looked through this, we can say that Russia definitely is not the king of the South now. Right now, I mean, could we argue that this is just illustrating, um, you know, 1789? I mean, is it true that Daniel eleven eleven is 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 paralleling Daniel eleven verse forty a, and Paneum is is paralleling Daniel eleven verse forty b? Can we say that? I think that would be an interesting premise to explore. Yeah, I mean, I think we've said that. I mean, that was sort of the whole idea is that what happens in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, is prefigured in these events that we see in Daniel chapter 11 earlier. These battles between the kings of the north and the king of the south are, are showing us or illustrating what happens in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. But in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, we have 1798 and 1989. That is, in 1798, you have the king of the south defeating the king of the north. And in 1989, the king of the north defeating the king of the south. 
But then you also have those happen and reoccur again in our lives. So I think we would still have to say that um, Daniel 11 verse um, 11 is still something future, right? We, we wouldn't just say it's only 1798 or it's only so so that's, you know, that's the way that I would look at it. Now, Stephen, did you have some thoughts on this further? Yeah, we had applied 1989 to verse 10, and then, well, mm -hmm. and then verse 41 lined up with verse 16. Right. And so yeah. the so, understanding, understanding then was the verses in between represent events between verse 40 and verse 41. Right. So you're saying between verse 40b and verse 41. Yes. Yeah. So from 1989 to the Sunday law, that we have events that keep repeating in our history between the North and the South. Now, when we first understood that, I don't think we, we, we really understood how we could use line upon line, how we could zoom into a line, how fractals actually worked, how wheels within wheels worked. So I would say that our understanding of that is correct, but not precise. So definitely Daniel 11, verse 10, it has the overflow. It has the Sunday law in it. Right. Um, but we know that in our history, there's many way marks that we can mark with this overflowing, not just the Sunday law itself. That is every line, every time we zoom into a way mark in a line, we create a new line and that line has way marks and we can zoom into that. And so we need to know at what magnification we're at. But I would think that people who are applying Daniel 11, 11 and saying that this is the Battle of Raphia and this was January 6, 2021. And and thinking that this is then midnight on the bigger line. And I don't know who would particularly do this, but people might be doing this because we've done it with in the past. We did it with November 11th. Um, or November 9th, pardon me, um, 1989. So there would just be this tendency to want to continue doing this. Just keep thinking, we're at midnight, we're at midnight, we're at midnight. But I, I think that we can discern that we're not at that midnight on Jeff's line. So when Jeff has a line from 2016, where you have 9-11, and even then 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel, and it even more closely relates to November 9th, 2019, more than September 11th, 2001. That is, that history is kind of compressed into one. So when we talked about 9-11 being the arrival of the second angel, that's because of our where we were in history. But now we can really apply it to November 9th, 2019. So you can take those two way marks and bring them together. So we're saying that that's 9-11. It's 11-9. And... And then we have a way mark that's still future, which Jeff had as midnight. And then you're going to have the midnight cry. And then you're going to have the Sunday law. And those are all future way marks. Right now we are we are approaching that first midnight and we need to watch and wait. That is, we can't just say, well, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. Those are off in the future. I'm just going to not worry about it till we get there. I'm not going to be studying, you know, let, let these guys sort it out. And, and I'll keep my eye, you know, my ear to the ground, my eye, you know, on what's happening maybe a little bit. And then when we start getting closer, then I'll start getting serious about really understanding this. But that, that would be a, a huge mistake for anybody who has this light to do. It might be true that people who have, don't have this light that when that light comes to them, they can see it. But somebody who's making that type of decision, 
will not accept that light when it comes. They will go off into darkness. You can't reject light and expect that you can just receive it again later on, right? Um, uh, the Hebrew word 4910 reminds Angela of Genesis 49.10, which I've thought about too, the prophecy about Judah and Jesus. So anyway, um, so we got, you know, we got some things cut out for us as far as looking at this. Now we can apply this. So we know that this is Raphi and Pidium's future. And we're going to look at this in more detail and see how these symbols fit in connection with our history. But part of it is that when we look at this other line here that, that we have drawn, let's get there. So when we look at this line, and I put January 20th, 2025, it's the arrival of the fourth angel. I mean, that's not predicting an event particularly, other than people are saying <laughs> that a president of the United States is going to be the seventh president, because Biden is the sixth. And that seventh president is a Civil War president. Right? He, he's going to line up with uh, Zedekiah, he's going to line up with, uh, you know, Artaxerxes, he's going to line up with different sort of, uh, of lines. Um, but this seventh, pre did you have a comment, Stephen, because your mic's on? Uh, no. Okay, I'll just, I'll just mute you there. Okay. Um, so, so I'm just saying that that is connecting us to a future line, right? That is, you know, we're going to examine it, but I don't know if we can we can take the line of Raphi and Paneum and mark them as future dates, you know, that we're going to say, this is going to happen in the future. But we can see that, we will should be able to see that, that Raphi and Paneum somehow relate to that fourth angel arriving. This is another expansion of this line. That's what I think we're going to see in you know the next few studies, as we start to look at Raphi and Panim, right? That's what we're, we're doing. Um, but what we we can say is that they're going to be midnight in the midnight cry on this bigger line that Jeff has. That's what I want to look at them as. But that we will see they are connected to our history, and and, and the dates that we're going to have in the future will be symbolic dates, not actual dates in where we're predicting events. They will be symbols that we see here in Daniel chapter 11 that help us to understand the connection between what's coming in the future and our own time. So there will be symbolic dates, not actual dates. But symbolic dates are still dates, right? And so some people would think you're time setting. We're not. We're not. We're not knowing what's going to happen when. We're just knowing that events are going to proceed in a certain way, and they'll be attached to symbolic dates. But how that will unfold, we don't know. That's that's my understanding. Okay. So <clears throat> anyway, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that you can be with each person who's continuing to study and look into these things and be with us, Lord, in our day-to-day -day life, the things that we have to do today. Um, we ask for your spirit to work upon our hearts and to teach us that we may learn in the school of Christ. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.